Hey guys, uh, welcome. Uh, this is the Oracle Autonomous Database Learning Lounge. I'm Marco Senecio, part of the product management team for uh, Oracle Autonomous Database. And today we have a very special session. We're going to be talking about how to embed machine learning and AI in your applications uh, using Oracle Machine Learning and Autonomous Database. So I'm recording this session, so it's going to be available probably by the end of the week uh, for you guys to watch. Okay. So for the uh, agenda today, For the agenda today, uh, we're going to have uh, an introduction to Oracle Machine Learning concepts uh, and the capabilities of OML uh, with Mark Hornick. Uh, he's a director of, of product management, uh, and he's going to introduce us all to the concepts and the surrounding components, the SQL, Python, R capabilities, right, of the Oracle Machine Learning. Um, all of that with the benefits of ADB, right? Then I'm going to be doing uh, a demo of the uh, Oracle Machine Learning UI components uh, in Autonomous Database. And then we're gonna have Sherry LaMonica, a consulting member of our, our technical staff, who's gonna be talking about the developer side, REST APIs, the Python code behind the scenes, third-party packages, right, that you can use, um, and, all, and model monitoring, right? The, the, those are the newer components that we have there. Uh, throughout, we're gonna have an open Q&A if you guys have uh, any questions, uh, please don't uh, hesitate to ask, okay? All right, so uh, to start, I would like to uh, ask you um, to type your questions in Q&A, okay? So there's a Q&A for Zoom. If you guys have any questions at any time, uh, please make sure to type it there. And we're gonna share links with you guys using chat, okay? This is just a, a, a bunch of links that are the most useful links for autonomous database in general. So if you guys want to take a screenshot um, and, and then, you know, uh, later it's going to be available anyway for you guys. But uh, this gives you an idea of all the different things that we can do um, and we have available for you guys, right? So without further ado, thank you, uh, Mark, for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and then you can start uh, sharing your screen. And um, thank you and take it away. Yeah, so it's great to see that, uh, you know, folks are uh, getting introduced to this technology and many are still uh, very uh, much involved with it as well. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us uh, for this session on embedding AI and machine learning in applications using Oracle Machine Learning on Autonomous Database, as Marcus said. So I'm Mark Hornick with Oracle Machine Learning Product Management and joined by uh, Sherry and Marcos, who are going to be giving us some great demos uh, later on in the session, as Marcos already mentioned. And, you know, we know that producing a machine learning model uh, is only uh, part of an overall AI ML based project and deploying and scaling those models in production can be more challenging. So we're going to explore how Oracle machine learning simplifies embedding this technology in your applications. And this is Oracle safe harbor statement since I'll mention a, a select uh, roadmap items as we go. Now we're going to focus on a few key areas. There are use cases for machine learning. Uh, where do machine learning models come from? Uh, how do you embed uh, models in your applications? And as I mentioned, you know, we'll have product demonstrations from Marcos and Sherry as we go. And then uh, lastly, I'll touch on some 23C features for OML. So let's dive into a few use cases. We're going to start with classification, right? Classification is a machine learning technique that we can use, for example, to predict customers with high lifetime value or who are likely to prepay their loan or perhaps default on their loan. Uh, other use cases may include predicting which vehicles need maintenance or if a customer is likely to churn or which customers we should prioritize with marketing campaigns. A second technique is regression, which could also be applied to some of these classification use cases but then we'd adapt them to predict a numeric outcome. Other reg uh, regression use cases include forecasting product demand, sales, or revenue. And of course, time series provides another class of algorithms that could be applied to these same use cases. Now, clustering helps with customer segmentation and document classification, which can overlap with the classification technique but we can also use clustering for grouping cell types or just exploratory data analysis for finding similar instances. Association rules helps to identify cross-sell and upsell opportunities. And anomaly detection is useful for transaction or claims fraud detection or just identifying unusual cases, which may signify the need for closer inspection of your data. And these examples, of course, just scratch the surface of what's possible. 
Now, so we've seen a variety of use cases and machine learning techniques, but what enables us to really address these use cases? Well, each of the machine learning techniques is supported by one or more algorithms, and these algorithms operate on data to produce machine learning models. And these models enable us to generate recommendations, predictions, as well as insights for use in applications. So let's say you produce, or maybe you're just given a machine learning model, how can you use it? Well, you can generate recommendations based on new data, for example, to indicate which products to promote to a given customer, or which customers you should contact first. You may want to do this interactively, say for a call center rep interacting with a specific customer, or maybe as a batch operation to provide a report on the top thousand customers for your sales force to contact today. You can make predictions such as what should this house value be? Is this claim likely fraud or how likely is this employee to leave? And when we talk about generating recommendations and predictions, the model is an input to a machine learning scoring function. Now, in addition, the model itself can contain useful insights to address questions like how do I define my customer segments or what are the likely root causes or maybe which features in my data are most predictive. And like most predictions, these insights can also be surfaced in applications and dashboards. So we've motivated why use machine learning models, but where do they come from? How do we go about getting them? Well, in terms of tools, there are multiple options used by people in a variety of roles. And these roles can include uh, data scientists, uh, machine learning engineers, or even uh, just machine learning savvy developers. Maybe you like to use SQL, PLSQL, R, Python, or prefer no-code user interfaces and automated machine learning, or as it's more commonly known, AutoML. Now, what you may not know is that your Oracle database and autonomous database instances already contain powerful machine learning algorithms and tools. And these are directly in the core database software, just like the query optimizer. And you can access these from SQL, R, Python, and REST APIs, as well as from no-code user interfaces. Now, next is uh, what we call open source tools. Uh, while there are many possible options to choose from, the two most popular are Python and R, along with their rich ecosystems of third-party packages that expand the functionality across multiple domains. And of course, there are plenty of other tools that support AI and ML. But when your data is principally in the database, Oracle Database and Autonomous Database offer advantages over other tools, like eliminating access latency, since there's no need to extract data from the database. Scalability and performance, taking advantage of memory optimizations and system provided distributed parallel processing. Reduce complexity by eliminating the need to manage additional tools separately and the need to code and test for independent failure points. And finally, reduce cost. Machine learning is in the database. It's included with your database license or subscription. Now, earlier, we introduced uh, use cases and their corresponding machine learning techniques. And Oracle Machine Learning in the Database supports these and other techniques. Now, for each of these, uh, OML supports several algorithms. Now, you might be asking, why do we have multiple algorithms for a given technique? Well, some algorithms are better at finding certain types of patterns in data than others. Some algorithms offer a greater degree of transparency to understand those patterns, the insights that were discovered. And each has its own computational demands, meaning that some are faster than others. There's a lot I could say about the features of these algorithms, including their performance characteristics, but I'll refer you to the link shown here, and we'll simply move on with some code examples. Now, how do we get an in-database model? Well, here's an example using OML for SQL to build a model to predict if customers are likely to buy travel insurance. We're using the PL SQL procedure, Create Model 2, which is part of the DBMS data mining package that's included with your Oracle database. And this produces a model in your user schema. But you can also build that same in-database model using R and Python functions from our Python and R interfaces. And you can use such models to, for example, score an individual customer using the prediction probability operator in a SQL query, using the model name provided above and see that you know, this customer is likely to buy insurance. This query could easily be invoked from tools like ODBC, JDBC, Apex, or any other interface that enables SQL access to the database. But let's step back and understand machine learning models a little bit more deeply. 
You might be asking, you know, what is a machine learning model? I've used that term several times already today. And as I mentioned, you know, model represents the patterns that are found in the data by a special purpose algorithm. Well, we talked about the regression technique earlier, and one of the simplest regression algorithms produces a linear regression model. From your high school math uh, classes, you might recall that a formula for a line is y equals mx plus b. Well, the algorithm is actually analyzing the data to determine optimal values of m, the slope, and b, the intercept. And these two values, m and b, comprise the model for our simple two-variable data set. Here, we're using departure delay to predict arrival delay of airline flights. Now, models often contain metadata, like the names of the variables and model quality metrics, among other things. But minimally, these two values, m and b, could be stored in a file, handed off to some scoring code that, when given a departure delay, can predict arrival delay using our simple formula. Now, with Oracle Machine Learning, you know, these models aren't stored in flat files. They're, they exist as first-class database schema objects, and there's no need to worry about keeping track of this file, since just like your data, your model has database-level security, backup, recovery, and governance. But let's continue with understanding regression models. By design, models aren't intended to be perfect. They need to generalize to be useful. And as a result, you know, the difference between the predicted value and the actual value is what's called a residual. And we want residuals to be as small as possible. And so uh, we want to compare these models. Uh, we're going to try to uh, use metrics like the uh, root mean square error to address that. And of course, enterprise uh, data can have hundreds or thousands of predictor variables with millions of records. So scalable algorithm implementations, as we have with in-database algorithms, are required to meet business objectives. Now, like regression, classification is a supervised technique that also involves using data that has a known outcome. For example, for a churn use case, customers need to be labeled as whether or not they've churned. That is, they've stopped being a customer. We want to be able to learn the patterns to classify such customers as churners or non-churners, as shown here. Now, there are many algorithms you can use to learn from this data to predict who's likely to churn in the coming weeks or months. And some algorithms, like decision trees, produce human interpretable rules. In this example, if the customer's age is over 45 and, say, income is less than 60K, then they're considered likely to churn. Now, a decision tree can produce multiple such rules, each defining a customer segment that may offer other opportunities for targeted marketing. As with regression, classification algorithms aren't perfect either. They make mistakes too. And one way to assess how well an algorithm makes predictions is what's called a confusion matrix. And it not only can give us accuracy metrics, but also tell us what types of errors are made. Now, before getting back to how uh, we actually build models ourselves, I want to explore the typical ML modeling process that you might go through. And this helps set the stage for discussing automated machine learning, or AutoML, that we'll discuss shortly. And as we said earlier, you know, data scientists and model builders in general typically have access to multiple algorithms to choose from for a given use case. And which of these should be tried? You know, which is going to turn out to be the best? So we start with one algorithm, perhaps the support vector machine, and using our prepared data set, we'll build a model using the default settings, or what are called hyperparameters. And we'll tune those hyperparameters to hopefully improve model quality. And we compare each new model against the previous ones and select the best one for this algorithm. And then we repeat this process with the next algorithm. And this iterative and trial and error approach is expensive, both in terms of time and compute resources. It also requires that you understand how to tune the hyperparameters for each type of algorithm. And so this is where AutoML comes in, you know, to simplify the modeling process by eliminating repetitive and time-consuming tasks. Not only increases your productivity, but also makes machine learning more accessible to other non-experts who you don't need to understand the detailed algorithm hyperparameters. So let's look at the API functions in OML for Pi, our Python API, that support this capability. Here we start with algorithm selection, where the top algorithms are ranked. And we see that SVM Gaussian is ranked highest. 
Next, we perform feature selection to find the columns that are most predictive for our algorithm. Here we see 13 columns being reduced to 9 for the previously selected algorithm. And then we do model tuning, which optimizes the hyperparameters for the selected algorithm and features. And after running these steps, you have a machine learning model that you can deploy in applications and dashboards. However, not all users want to write code, and so OML allows you to click your way to a model. Using the AutoML UI no-code user interface, you can build models with minimal input. Just specify the data and the target in what's called an experiment, and the tool does the rest. With a few clicks, you can generate editable starter notebooks, and these notebooks contain Python code using OML for Pi for building the selected model, including the settings AutoML chose to produce that model. And you can also rename models and make them easier to recognize in your schema and applications, as well as deploy those models to OML services. And we'll talk more about OML services later. So now, let's explore options for embedding machine learning models in your applications. Now, when it comes to modeling and production-ready deployment, there are multiple ways to produce and consume models in OML. Let's say we start with in-database models, and we have applications that want to use them. Well, perhaps the simplest way is to write a SQL query to make predictions, whether for individual scores or for batch scoring, where we may score an entire table of customers, perhaps to prioritize them for contacting uh, them with a marketing campaign. You know, here we're using some of the prediction operators integrated with Oracle SQL, and we're using the name of the first class database model object, namely by travel insurance. So now, you know, Marcus will give us a demonstration of the Oracle Machine Learning AutoML UI to build and deploy a model to OML services, and then OML Notebooks with OML for Pi to build and evaluate a model and use that model for scoring from Python. So over to you, Marcus. So basically what you guys are seeing here uh, is the uh, Autonomous Database Console, right? So in Oracle Cloud um, Infrastructure, this is the Autonomous Database Console, and the way to get to the Oracle Machine Learning components that I'm going to show you guys we have uh, two ways, right? One is you can click on the Autonomous Database uh, Actions here. So if you click on Database Actions, it opens up Database Actions. Or if you click on the Tool Configuration, uh, you can actually, you know, scroll down here, you're going to see Oracle Machine Learning User Interface. Uh, and there's a URL that you can copy. So you just click on Copy, and it's going to copy that, and then you can paste it on on a window, right? So if you go to Database Actions, uh, this is how it looks like. So this is the main window for database actions, and you can see that there is Oracle Machine Learning right here, right? So clicking on this guy is going to open up the login window for you, all right? Now, the main login window then looks like this. You get to the UI, and then you have uh, several uh, links, or how do I do some things here? Uh, you have the quick actions, uh, and then uh, you have on the right, you know, recent notebooks and recent experiments and things like that, right? So. What we're going to do is we're going to start with the auto ML then. Uh, there are two ways to start with it. You can click it on the quick actions or I can click on my menu here on top and go to auto ML experiments. All right. Now there is an experiment there already, but I'm going to create a brand new one just so that you guys see, you know, how, um, how are the steps here? So I can call it, you know, ADB learning lounge experiment, right? Uh, and I'll, I'll be doing that, and I, and I click on the data source, right? That's all I need here. So the data source, um, and then I can select my data. So I have access to all the schemas that I have access to, right, as a user. And I have access to, of course, my own schema and the data that I put there. So I'm going to bring this data set, right, input data. Uh, so when it brings that data in, it shows you the values here. So down here, you have all the columns and, uh, you know, some basic statistics about them, right? So, but all I need to do here is to select the prediction target, right? And um, so in this case, uh, it's going to be affinity card. And, and the second I choose that, uh, this prediction type selects uh, automatically switches to classification, right? Because it's a binary target is whether a customer has acquired, right? My, uh, my premium product or not, right? So it's a one or zero, right? So, uh, the next thing I need to do is case ID, right? So I select what is the customer ID that I have. So you can start typing and then it's going to find uh, the customer ID. And, you know, optionally, you can go down here and 
maybe there's something you cannot use, right, in your country, like customer gender, right? So maybe that shouldn't be part of the model, right? So you can uncheck that, for example, right? Um, other things that are additional settings for uh, the statisticians and data scientists, you can choose how many models you want to run, what's the duration, database service level, maybe you want to run it in medium to get more parallelism there, right? Um, and what is the model metric you want to use, right? So, uh, and also you can uncheck a specific algorithm if you don't want to, right? If you don't want to use that. But we can just go all the way up and just click on start and faster results. Um, and now it's starting. That's all I needed to do. Uh, this is starting an AutoML then. Uh, it's going to go through the steps that Mark talked about, about uh, selecting what's the best algorithm first, and then it's going to look at the, uh, in this case, going to do an, an automatic uh, sampling, right, uh, to balance the samples uh, of the output, and then it's going to do uh, the, uh, each algorithm that is going to do a feature selection and then a model tuning, okay? All right, so this is running. Uh, again, I left it here so that you guys can see, uh, uh, you know, the steps that it's, it is running through, right? Um, I can, uh, you know, stay here and, and see the, the steps going if I wanted to, right, one by one. I can close the running window and just, you know, at, at any point I can click that back in. Uh, and here you see that it already chose these algorithms. These were the five algorithms chosen by the process, right, right now. And then it's going to start doing feature selection for them, and then it's gonna go into model tuning, right? So to make it uh, quicker, I can go back to my experiments. I can see that this experiment is running, right? But I'm gonna go and get into this one, which was already um, finished, right? Already run, so I can click on the completed. I can see it took seven minutes. Uh, and this, in this case, it ran, I ran, I chose actually to run all the algorithms, right? So uh, in this case, then I can see each algorithm here, I can see all of their um, statistics. The balanced accuracy was the one that I was looking for, but I can check all the other uh, statistics as well, right? Um, and then I can see the algorithms there, so I can rename the algorithms instead of getting their cryptic names, I can rename the algorithms, right? And make them a little easier to remember then and to work with, right, later. If I click on the model name, I can see the details, right? And that's why I know which were the columns or the attributes that were deemed interesting. And you can also see a confusion matrix, which means, you know, I missed 1% of the people that actually were going to buy my product. And my, my uh, model in this case thought that people were not buying it, right? So predicted zero, but I was able to capture 22%. So a, a lot of others, the majority here that actually bought the product, even though I mistakenly thought that a lot of people that didn't buy my product, uh, right, I thought they were going to buy, but it's okay. I mean, I, if I'm sending like a promotion, right, in this case, I'll be safe. I, I'm saying, okay, I'm gonna be giving some freebies, but I'm gonna capture the actual folks that are buying, right? So this is the balance that, uh, you know, a data scientist is gonna do, right? Uh, but I can deploy them. So I can, with one click, I can deploy this affinity card. Um, and uh, I can, uh, you know, I need to give it a unique uh, URI because then I'm deploying it to uh, Oracle Machine Learning Services. You guys are going to see later uh, today with uh, Mark, uh, Explanation, and, and Sherry. And then I want to share that. So not only my user, but I want to all the other users for this PDB, in particular for this database, to be able to uh, score, right, any data sets with uh, this model, right? So... There you go. So I deployed the model now. Um, and then, you know, as, as I mentioned, you can rename it, but also you can create a notebook, right? So this is actually very interesting because if I click a button here and the OK, what I'm doing now is AutoML UI saying, OK, you want to be able to reproduce this model the way I ideally identified it. So I click on Open Notebook now, and uh, it's going to start our notebook engine, and it's going to show me uh, exactly the steps that I would need to take to actually recreate the algorithm with the specified hyperparameters uh, by, you know, my, by myself. And then I can reproduce and run this in any database, right? We're talking on-premise databases as well, right? So I could just run this process in an on-premise database without any problem. So I have here then um, 
OML user, so it tells me the uh, experiment, it tells me what data was, uh, you know, what data sets I was using, uh, classification. So as long as I have that data set available, uh, and then I'm going to be able to run it. So the things that I'm doing here is just in Python now, right? So it's using the Python API, import OML, is building the query, uh, only using the columns that were important for that model, right? And then it's going to prepare the data with uh, training and tests here. And it's going to be able to show me the settings that were used, right? These are the settings for that GLM uh, ridge regression model um, that I should use to build a model. And that's going to run a model fit. So again, I'm in Python API, but I'm building the model uh, inside the database, right? And then I see the model and I get, you know, uh, data for scoring and I can score the data. Right, so I can score the data using the model I just built here, okay? And finally show the quality metric. Um, now, we also launched uh, the notebooks. Uh, so there's a notebooks uh, early adopter interface. This is our new notebooks. And uh, on this interface, we have a few changes. So I'm going to open up and show you guys around the tool. At the same time, I'm gonna show you some of the Python capabilities, um, SQL capabilities, right, the script. So uh, basically, this new uh, UI uh, layout and, and, and format, right? So we got a lot of different things going on this one. We have uh, more graphics uh, capabilities. Uh, you can choose straight out from the top here what's your um, interpreter, right? Low, medium, or high. Uh, and you can choose a different visual um, layout, right? You can choose Zeppelin or Jupyter. So I'm using Zeppelin because I got some side-by-side -side comparisons to show you guys. But uh, it's it's uh, you know these are options for you right. So the first step that we're doing here, we're loading data. Loading data from where right? So we're not really only tied to the data in the database right. You guys are developers. You can load data from anywhere. So you can load data from GitHub. Here's an example, right? Uh, and an op a second option, I'm loading data from uh, object storage. So I have a DBMS Cloud Create credentials command that I can use and I can create credentials for OCI. I can do it for AWS, for, you know, Google's cloud, right? You can create credentials there and then you can point them to the URI you need. And again, point that and create an external table. Now I'm creating an external table. I'm not even loading the data. I'm just pointing to it and Autonomous Database can query that data, right? And you can use it on OML. Now, uh, what I'm doing here now is physically creating a table locally now based on that external table, okay? And I'm changing the buy insurance, whether a customer was gonna buy the insurance, they said yes or no, I'm switching it to one or zero, okay? To make it easier on, on myself later on. But, uh, and then on the right-hand side, I have an example of for, you know, something you can do. You can push a scikit-learn database, or data sets, right? Um, uh, from, uh, from the scikit-learn packages data sets uh, back to the Oracle database. So I'm just creating OML create. I actually create an Oracle table with the name that I'm giving it here. So I'm pushing digits there, right? Uh, and anyway, so continuing working on, you're gonna create the op, a Python proxy object, right? So we're gonna say OML sync table equals that. That means I'm creating a proxy object to that table and it's a pandas uh, table. So as far as Python knows, it's a pandas data frame. It's a special pandas data frame. So I can do like had to give me the first few records, right? Give me the first five records of that table and it, they come back to you. So you can see here all the data that we have there, right? And these are all the data that is in that table in the database, but I'm using my Python commands, right? Had and getting the result uh, in a, a special format here, okay? And you can, again, you can play with these things. You can, you can, request that to come back to you as text if you wanted to, but you know, of course this is more, uh, this is a little fancier, right? Easier to read. Um, then um, we can do SQL as well. So on the same exact table, I can run percent SQL and you know, run it there and fetch the first five rows only. And these are the same exact five rows that I have above, okay? Uh, continuing on, you always do data preparation, right? Before building a, a machine learning uh, model. So. In this case, I'm just dropping a few columns, right? I'm, I'm dropping the column buy insurance because remember I created a new column called target. So I don't need the, the buy insurance as well, but also I'm dropping last name and first name, right? Because the reason it can't be you know, good for your model to try to 
predict the probability that Marcos is going to buy a product because his name is Marcos, right? Unless he's headphones and then, then it's, it's a yes, high probability. But, but then, um, so checking statistics, so you can do dot shape, right? Uh, that's, again, a command from uh, Python. We can do cross tab. And you can, again, select the cross tab on different ways, uh, different displays. So, you know, table or uh, graphics, right? So whatever fits your taste better. We're splitting that into training and test. Again, I'm using all Python commands, right? This is dot split on that input data, creating these two new proxy, um, right, objects for Python. Uh, and now I have a training and a test. Uh, and then uh, build a, mach uh, a machine learning algorithm. Now I'm going to build a model, a machine learning model using the neural networks algorithm. And uh, I can add as many settings as I want. I'm using a three layer uh, neural networks with eight, eight and two uh, neurons per layer, different activation functions like arc tangent, bipolar sigmoid and, and hyperbolic tangent. And all of these things are, I'm going to do a dot fit. Again, it's a standard uh, Python commands, right? For scikit-learn, for example, they do a dot fit on that object to fit a model. Um, and then I can check the accuracy, right? Again, using Python's dot score, I can check the accuracy on the test data set. So the model is down here. So you, you got access to the model and, and you got all that information about the model. Um, and then we're gonna score now a test data set and add a supplemental column. So I'm scoring the test data set, right? And using that model to predict uh, that. And then I'm asking it to add my supplemental columns, right? The case ID, cause I need to know uh, that person so that I can then send a, a campaign to that guy. Uh, and I'm, so I'm computing both not only the probability, right, that that person is going to buy, but also um, the prediction, right? So at the end of the file then now, when I look at, uh, at that data set, at that proxy object, right, that's pulling data from the database, I got the prediction, right, whether the guy's going to buy it or not, uh, probability of zero, probability of one, right? So you can switch from all of these, and then you can see whoever has a pro prediction one is going to have a high probability of buying, right? That's the idea here. Okay, so uh, using that information, you can also do fancy things with Python. So for example, in here, I have, I have code for running these kind of things, right? So doing a confusion matrix, like we saw with AutoML um, UI. Uh, I got accuracy, area under the curve, and F1 score. I can see some nice charts, distribution of predictions, lift charts, all of these uh, statistics, right? So, uh, and again, all of this code is going to be there for you guys to use that as, as examples as well. Uh, this is available in the templates as well, but I'm, I'm going to share with you guys this specific uh, notebook here. And finally, uh, the prediction details. This is one of the most powerful things we have, which is uh, you um, can actually see the reason why that model or the, um, the model thought that this person was going to buy, right? So this was based on bank funds, the number of transactions on the teller, number of transactions on ATM, their check-in balance, right? Their lifetime value and things like that. And then the reason why the, the model thought this guy was not going to buy, and he actually didn't, right? So he did, made a mistake on the first one, but the second one and, and the others here are, are okay. The second one, he thought, hey, there is only one transaction on ATM, 11 monthly checks, uh, right? There's one transaction on the teller, there's customer 10 year, five years, a total number of automatic, automatic payments are a lot. So maybe that's not a great customer for us, right? Again, that is available as well on SQL. So if you use SQL for scoring, we're going to materialize that data. So the test data that we just used, we're going to actually take that guy and we, in from Python, I'm materializing it now. That proxy object becomes an Oracle database table called NN scores table. And uh, I can just run this SQL uh, using XML table. So I can parse these columns. And now I got the reason why this guy thought this was a prediction uh, is the check-in balance is 26, the automated payments is 0.436, and the money over, monthly overdrawn is you know 54, right? So that's basically what I wanted to show you guys. There's a lot of flexibility, a lot of things you can do here. Um, so again, this is very quick. We have hundreds of templates, right, on on the notebooks. So if you guys go to templates, examples. We have hundreds of examples using Python, using SQL, and using R as well. Okay, so all of these guys are available for you guys to 
to choose and check and, and you can filter them for algorithm like neural networks, right? So all of these things are available to you guys there. Uh, in addition to that, uh, in here we have jobs. So I can actually schedule a notebook to run. Once I have that notebook and I know that this is a recurring notebook that I want to use, um, I can actually then go in and schedule that notebook, right? I search for my notebook and I can have a start date, repeat frequency. So it's a, it's a batch job, right? How many failures would I allow? Can I automatically retry to run? And this guy is going to, you know, is going to be there and you're going to be able to go and come back and check the status and see, you know, how, how many, you know, executions you had and all that. Okay. Uh, and not only that, right, this is using autonomous database. It comes with it. You already have OML notebooks. If you want to roll your own, you can. So if you want to run your own Jupyter, you have a Jupyter server somewhere, you want to use your own Python, you can. You can use Oracle Machine Learning for Python. Here is Oracle Machine Learning for Python running on a Jupyter server, right? So all you need to do, you got a connection to the, uh, to the database there, and then you got functionality of all the transparency layers there. Uh, you got a standard Python syntax on the data, right? You got uh, you know, charts, you got uh, all of these different capabilities, right? All of these OML graphics, box plot stuff is available there. Um, if you want to use uh, Zeppelin open source, this is Zeppelin open source uh, release 0 0.10. Um, and again, same thing. I'm running here. I'm just connecting to the database using, uh, you know, Python, right? OML for Pi. And I'm running these different types of graphics and capabilities. I'm building a expectation maximization clustering algorithm here, a uh, model, right? And I'm building that model and I'm uh, studying the model. So I created these little charts and in 3D, I'm trying to identify what's the best number of clusters, right? So again, all of these uh, brings you a lot of flexibility, right? So hopefully that was, uh, that was good. Um, thank you very much again, and I'll stop sharing and Mark, uh, take it back. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Marcos. That was a great demonstration, highlighting a lot of the different tools that we have. All right, so we're going to switch gears now, and we're going to talk about deploying R and Python-based solutions through the database environment. You know, deploying solutions using R and Python uh, can introduce several challenges for application developers, you know, including separately managing R and Python engines, as well as scalability and performance concerns. So OML for R and OML for Pi, as you know, we've just seen from, uh, you know, Marcus's demonstration as well, supports native R and Python interfaces to the in-database algorithms. But they also support embedded execution to deploy R and Python code using database spawned and controlled engines. And this code can also use third party packages from R and the Python ecosystems. Now, embedded execution enables invoking user defined R and Python functions from SQL. And on autonomous database, you can also use the REST API. And this greatly simplifies embedding R and Python results in your applications, especially when those applications aren't written using Python or R. Now, an additional benefit is the ability to easily specify data parallel and task parallel processing. For example, you might want to store a native Python model in the database and use it to score large volume data across multiple Python engines that are spawned and managed by the database environment. Each engine scores chunks of data uh, provided by the database, perhaps 10,000 to a million rows at a time at your specification. And the scores produced from all the engines are available in the database for immediate access as a single database table. So to visualize embedded execution, consider using additional Python packages like scikit-learn or matplotlib to develop and deploy solutions with user-defined functions that are stored in the database. And this also serves as a handoff to application developers from other data science team members. Now then, using SQL or REST endpoints, developers can deploy these functions using database spawned and managed Python engines where these functions and data are automatically loaded. And the results uh, can then include both structured data and images that are stored back in the database. And the Python engines are automatically cleaned up. 
So our data science team could uh, store their R and Python models and user-defined R and Python functions in the database. Then application developers can invoke these through the SQL queries and on autonomous databases, as we've said, through REST endpoints. Now, similar functionality using SQL is available on Oracle Database as well. Now we've noted that uh, embedded execution allows using third-party Python and R packages, and this is both for Oracle Database and Autonomous Database. But on Autonomous Database, you enable this through the creation of Conda environments using OML notebooks. And this further extends Autonomous Database as a platform for data science where you can supplement in-database functionality with that from the R and Python communities, even using it within Python and R paragraphs in OML notebooks. Now, using your admin credentials, you install third-party packages in Conda environments and upload them to Oracle Object Storage. Then you can download and activate these Conda environments for direct use in OML notebooks or in combination with embedded execution from OML for Pi and OML for R. Now, for Oracle database users, packages can be installed directly in Python and R engines that reside on the database server machine. I encourage you to check out you know, this blog and uh, these office hour session for uh, more details on uh, using these third-party packages. But now, Sherry will highlight using third-party packages from OML notebooks and running an OML for Pi embedded execution job using the Python and SQL APIs. Sherry? So um, this is Oracle Machine Learning Notebooks. And as Marcos mentioned, it supports R, Python, SQL, PL SQL, Conda and Markdown code, and it's automatically ready and available to use after your autonomous database is provisioned. And as Mark mentioned, the admin user, um, the user with the admin credentials is going to create a Conda environment with your third-party packages and save the Conda environment to object storage. And then the OML user can download the Conda environment and use it in the notebook session. So the first thing that I'm doing here is a listing a named environment that's already been um, saved by my admin user in object storage. And this is a my Pi ENV. And the first thing that I want to do to use it is to download and activate the Conda environment. With the Conda environment activated, you can invoke package functionality in these notebook paragraphs. So the Conda environment is um, MyPy ENV, and the Python packages in the Conda environment are uh, Keras, TensorFlow, Seaborn, and all of their dependencies. So I can list all of the packages that are available in the Conda environment with the Conda list command. I can see all of them here. I think there are a total of like 145 of them. And then now I can just import the libraries in a Python paragraph or R, if I was using R, I'm importing Keras and TensorFlow, Seaborn, uh, Pandas and NumPy are included with OMA for Pi. And now I'm loading the Iris data from the Seaborn um, data set into Python paragraph and splitting the data into test and train sets. And then I'm creating a Python UDF. Um, this, in this example, this UDF is building a model that predicts an iris flower species um, using the iris data when given flower measurements. And the UDF returns uh, both data, structured data, a confusion matrix, and uh, an image depicting the pairwise relationships in the iris data set. So I'm first going to run the code. Um, this UDF in directly in Python. And then I'm going to invoke the UDF in the uh, OMA for Pi embedded Python execution APIs, Python, SQL, and REST. To show you what that looks like, just run the UDF directly in Python. We see our, um, our data and our image are returned. Now next, to use the embedded Python APIs, I need to create a database table from my pandas data frame with the OML create function. So I'm doing that. I'm creating a pandas data frame and also getting a proxy object, Iris demo. And I can show, um, I use the first couple of rows of Iris demo there. Now to run the um, UDF using the Python API for embedded Python execution, I'm using the OML table apply. I'm passing the proxy object to table apply the um, 
the user defined function and I'm setting graphics to true so that I can get both the data and image in the return value. And then next, I'm actually creating a string representation of this UDF and saving it to the script repository, the OML for Py script repository. And that is where we can run our um, SQL and REST and Python embedded um, functions. We can run scripts from this script repository from those APIs. And I'll show you what that looks like next. So here I'm using PyQ table eval, which is the equivalent of the OML table apply. I'm the input um, data is the iris demo. In the parameter list, I'm setting the graphics slack to true, specifying PNG um, output so that I get both data and the image, the script name as it um, in the script repository, and the um, conda environment name. And as you can see, I get on the left the um, structured data and then the image back. Now, the SQL API for embedded Python execution also has an asynchronous mode where if I want to wait for the um, script to finish running, I can continue working. And the only difference there is that I'll set the async flag to true and I'll get a job ID back. And the job ID is right here. And with that job ID, I can um, pull when the, when the script is finished running, I can pull the results when um, using the PyQ job uh, result function. So if I pass that job ID to the PyQ job result, I get the, um, the result back. And then if I want to pull the job status to see if it's still running, I can use PyQ job status passing that job ID. And I'll either get the um, result location or a message that the job is still running. And then finally, the REST API for embedded Python execution, I can run that from a REST client like curl or Postman. I've included them here in the notebook for illustrative purposes only. You cannot run these REST commands in an OML notebook, but here's my curl command. Um, I have to get my token first, um, my autonomous database token in order to interact with the REST APIs and the SQL API as well. I'm um, selecting from uh, the my input table, my environment name is my PyEnv. That's the conda environment. I'm setting the graphics flag to true. And this post request is going out to the table apply endpoint. And I specify my script name. And the result will look exactly like the return value from the SQL API for embedded Python execution. The REST API also has an asynchronous mode where I set the async flag to true. I will get my a job ID in the return value, and then I can retrieve the result when my script um, completes. And all of this functionality is also available for OMO for R. The example is in this notebook, which we provided at the end of this session. I'm not gonna go through that example today. Okay, back to you, Mark. All right, thank you, Sherry. That was a great demonstration. Love seeing how we can work with third-party packages uh, through OML notebooks. All right. So now I've mentioned OML services a few times, so let's officially introduce that component. With OML services on autonomous database, you can manage and deploy machine learning models using a REST API for flexible application integration. And scoring using these models is optimized for streaming in real-time applications. That means that they're fast, often with millisecond response times. And unlike other solutions that require provisioning a VM for 24-7 availability, OML Services is provisioned and maintained as part of Autonomous Database, so users pay only the additional compute when actually producing predictions. Now, OML Services enables key elements of an MLOps strategy, supporting model management, deployment, and most recently, monitoring. The model management and deployment services enable you to deploy in database models from both Oracle Database and Autonomous Database. And OML Services enables data monitoring to flag, for example, data drift and to catch data quality issues proactively. And you can monitor deployed models for concept drift and changes in quality metrics. I'll say more about that in a moment. It also supports cognitive text analytics, like extracting topics and keywords, sentiment analysis, and text summary and similarity. So continuing our earlier example, where we use SQL to score uh, data within database models, 
we're going to use REST endpoints or the OML models UI on autonomous database where you can easily deploy an in-database model to OML services and then you can use REST endpoints to score data using that model from your application. Now here's an example using the score endpoint in a curl command, uh, and you'll notice that we have the by insurance URI and the input record that we want to score that's provided in JSON format. Now in previous examples, we focused on in database model deployment, but uh, you can also produce models outside the database. For example, using OCI data science or local Python or R environments that might even leverage GPU compute resources. And these models can be built using third party packages like TensorFlow and then exported in Onyx format. Now Onyx, if you're not familiar with it, is an open format that's built to represent machine learning models. And using the REST interface, they can be imported to OML services. As before, enterprise applications and dashboards can easily use these models to make predictions using the same REST API as for the in-database models. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, you know, we've recently uh, added to OML services data and model monitoring, and this expands support for the data and model lifecycle and ML ops. And there are several aspects to uh, monitoring. You know, with data monitoring, we're providing insights into how your enterprise data evolves over time. And this helps to maintain data quality standards separate from or in combination with uh, machine learning. Now, model monitoring involves identifying when a user specified model metric like accuracy or R squared significantly changes, or the distribution of predicted values deviates too much from initial values. And this can signal the need to rebuild your model. Now, here are some uh, links to resources that discuss uh, monitoring in more detail. Now, as a preview, we're also releasing a no-code UI for data and model monitoring. And this preview is about the soon-to-be-released uh, data monitoring UI, where here you specify a new monitor, which involves identifying the baseline and new data, and also the repeat frequency, starting time, and, and other options. And after the monitor runs, you have access to the results, like a plot of the data drift over time, and whether it surpasses the specified threshold. And you also see changes in individual column statistics, as illustrated through the graphics here. Now, we can even get deeper insights into changes in individual column data using several pre-computed metrics. And here we're showing the population stability index for the column amount sold. But there are other metrics that are available as well. And we can see uh, the numeric statistic summary along with a visual display from the baseline and recent test results. And if you specified a cross tab column like the channel ID, you get a frequency table and heat map containing the distribution across the two columns. So next we'll see a brief demonstration of OML services involving scoring and data monitoring. Back to you, Sherry. Okay, I'll share my screen. Okay, so we'll use the Postman client for our REST requests. And um, to start, an access token is required to access OML services. And over here on the upper right, I have saved my Oracle machine learning you know, username, password, and the OML URL corresponding to my autonomous database. Um, and I have saved them as variables. So if I um, uh, send a post request to the token endpoint with this information, I get this access token back and I have access to OML services now. So the first thing that we're going to do is to score an um, uh, in-database model that was deployed from the AutoML UI. Um, the name of the model is ADBLL Affinity Card, and I can actually, there's a filter on model name where I can just look at um, some details for this model. I can see the model ID and the model name and um, whether it's shared with other users in the PDB and when it was, um, when it was stored. Before I can do the scoring, I need to create a scoring endpoint. And to do that, I need to take that model ID and the model URI that um, the user provided when they deployed the model. Um, I can send a post request then to the deployment endpoint and create the scoring endpoint. If I want to take a look at the deployment details, I can use the model URI and send a, a GET request to get a few more details about this model, including the um, model metadata the mining function and the different attributes. 
Now to score the model, I have a couple of options. In this case, I'm um, using a, a single input record, but I can also do um, a mini batch of records or an entire table uh, with batch scoring. And um, here I'm including the top end details with the input record, which is optional. And you're going to see that you get back not only the probabilities, but the prediction details. And the prediction details are going to, going to tell you the columns that were um, the most important for the specific customer. So I can look at this, and uh, there's a few different formats. You can look at this in this pretty format or raw, but the visualize um, will help you see yeah, this a little bit better. You can see that for this particular customer, that household size was the most impactful and um, occupation has the least impact on the top four. And uh, I have an example that shows um, inputting uh, two records. So when you do the mini batches, these records are part of the payload. With batch scoring, um, you would set up a job, a special job like you would with um, the data monitoring. So let's take a look at the data monitoring from the REST API. So we can define a data monitoring job. I'll just send that right now. And in the job schedule, up here, you can kick off the job immediately, like I'm doing here, or you can provide dates for a scheduled runtime. And you can also spec specify like the maximum number of runs for the job, which in this case is five. And in the job properties, we provide a job name and type, which is data monitoring. And as I mentioned, we also support model monitoring and batch scoring jobs. Um, we have the baseline data and the new data to compare it to, the repeat frequency, the starting time, and um, other options. Uh, for example, we have the option to recompute all of the previous results or only monitor um, the new data. And so when I kick off this job, I will get a job ID. Then I can query to get information on the job, like um, viewing the job details. So in this, this Postman collection, I have um, saved the job ID as a variable, and now I can look and see the job details. And in the job details, you can see the, um, the parameters that we use to um, kick off the job, but all of the, the defaults um, for the non-required parameters, like the job start date and end date. Um, so let's see. Um, after each run, you can query the output table, and the output table provides the changes in the, the data statistics. The drift metric is measured on a, a zero to one scale and whether it surpasses your specified threshold. So the um, a zero means that the drift uh, model cannot discriminate at all between the data sets, and a score of one means that it can perfectly discriminate. So we have a couple of other things that we can do with these jobs. We can update a data monitoring job um, by sending a post request to the jobs endpoint with the job ID. And um, there are certain parameters that you can use to update um, a job, start and end date threshold, the threshold that you specify for the drift, um, recompute, and the feature list. So here, I'm updating the threshold, the recompute, I'm setting to true, and I'm modifying the feature list to be monitored. So amount sold and promo ID. And then I can also um, provide, uh, do it like a job action. So the job actions are generally to uh, disable a job or to run a job outside of its schedule. If I wanna see the results now, I can send um, a post request to the action endpoint, the job action endpoint with the job ID, and it will run it um, right now. So if the job is finished running, this will work. Yeah, the job is still running. Um, so it's giving me a conflict. But if the job was completed running, I would get a um, 204 response with no body. And then I can go and query that output table that I specified when I kicked off the job. And that's all I wanted to show you today. Back to you, Mark. OK. Thank you very much, Sherry. It was great to see the details on how to use the REST API. All right. 
Moving on, so you know this table uh, provides a quick summary of the components available in OML and where they, where they are available on Oracle uh, a database, an autonomous database. You'll notice that all of the components are available with autonomous database serverless. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, I'd like to briefly highlight some of the 23C enhancements for OML uh, with uh, Oracle Database. And the first two have to do with OML support for the new Boolean data type and uh, tables of up to 4K columns. We've also improved scalability when using high cardinality uh, categorical features to address data sets with millions of categorical values uh, while avoiding uh, memory limitations. And for partition models, we've dramatically improved performance when building models with thousands of partitions. For lineage, uh, this feature allows you to associate the data query that supplied the training data when building the model. And for expectation maximization clustering, we've enabled identifying outliers and anomalies, adding another algorithm to support use cases like fraud detection. Now we're gonna take a closer look at some of the algorithm enhancements that we have listed on the right here as well. So first up is explicit semantic analysis, which supports text analytics uh, feature extraction. In 23C, ESA enhances integrated text mining for in-database algorithms. And this means that the more powerful ESA algorithm will perform the automatic feature extraction. And this enhances using structured data with unstructured data, such as call center rep notes on customers or maybe physician notes on patients. ESA also supports DocTVec dense projections with embeddings. In the case of uh, GLM, a generalized linear model for classification, we've added additional link functions for enhanced support of binary targets, among other uses. And for extreme gradient boosting, we've expanded support for survival analysis, which is particularly useful when predicting equipment failures and healthcare outcomes. And we're also enabling feature interaction constraints and monotonic constraints so that data scientists can further limit variable interactions. Now, last on this list is exponential smoothing uh, with the time series forecasting algorithm, which has a wide range of hyperparameters. And the enhancement here is to automate the hyperparameter tuning to produce better models without manual or exhaustive search of all those hyperparameters. We've also enabled multiple time series, which conveniently computes backcasts and forecasts for time series, uh, multiple time series in support of time series regression. Now, you know, here's a link to the OML office hour session with the more complete review of recently introduced features and our broader uh, roadmap for the coming year. So in summary, you know, when it comes to embedding machine learning in your applications, you have multiple options with Oracle machine learning. You can build in database models using SQL, R, Python, and AutoML interfaces, and then use those models to make predictions or gain insights in a way that's convenient for application development. You can use third-party models exported in Onyx format with OML services as well. You can deploy open source R and Python based solutions that use third-party packages using interfaces also convenient for application development. Overall, you've seen through uh, multiple examples and demonstrations how you can leverage AI and machine learning in your own applications through Oracle Autonomous Database. Now, so for more information on Oracle Machine Learning and to get started using OML, uh, check out these resources. You know, in addition to our web page and blog, see the OML GitHub repository, which contains code examples and notebooks using SQL, R, and Python APIs. Um, our OML Office Hours provides updates on OML technology. We have a rich library of over 70 recorded sessions with component how-tos and use cases and product demonstrations, and these have been viewed over 50,000 times. To try OML on autonomous database, check out our Oracle Live Labs workshops. Uh, the link here is for OML Fundamentals, which covers several of the OML components that we've highlighted. And so with that, I thank you for joining us and back to you, Marcos. Thank you very much, Mark. So guys, um, thank you very much for staying uh, late. Uh, now I see already um, of several uh, <laughs> questions coming in. So. Uh, I'm going to make sure that you guys get access to all the slides, uh, all of these uh, links that I'm showing you guys here. I'm going to uh, right now, I'm going to right now put them in chat um, just to make sure that uh, if you guys uh, want to check them out, you guys have that possibility. So they're in, in the webinar chat. Um, and uh, 
again, uh, thank you for joining. Uh, really, uh, final thoughts here. Um, we got uh, all of these links are going to be shared with you guys. The exact same place where you guys came in today, you're going to see links to the next sessions, links to the recordings, and links to the slides. Okay. Uh, so we're going to make sure of that. We have a few uh, sessions coming up uh, data sharing on autonomous database. We got um, uh, multi cloud as well, uh, which is probably the next one. So uh, keep an eye on the same channel, the same ways you guys uh, came in today. Keep an eye there. I'm going to make sure that I share that information. Okay. So uh, for now, uh, again, thank you very much, uh, guys, for joining. I'm going to leave uh, this channel uh, open. So, Mark, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sherry, for joining uh, today and for the presentation. I'm going to leave this channel open, guys. So the session is still going because we still have questions we're answering. Uh, but uh, thank you again, and uh, see you guys in a couple of weeks.